Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, lecture again. Uh, let us continue our discussion on the uh, tensile test and we are looking at the uh, results of a typical tensile test and then we, we are looking at basically the interpretation of the results which is a, a basic outcome of a simple tensile test. So in the last class we have looked at uh, the engineering stress strain curve and uh, various parameters one can uh, derive from that outcome of the results. So we also looked at uh, some derived parameters like uh, true stress, true strain um, curve and uh, what is the usefulness of this curve and how it is uh, related to engineering stress strain um, parameters. Uh, so we will continue our discussion on that and uh, what we are going to discuss today is um, how this uh, slip character and the strain hardening coefficients uh, for several metals are compared. When you compare these uh, parameters, how do they uh, appear? So, for example, if you look at this uh, table uh, where uh, the stacking fault energy and strain hardening coefficient and slip characters, they are all summarized for typically for stainless steel, copper and aluminum. What you have to notice here is uh, the, the parameter stacking fault energy. We have already seen this. This is not uh, new to us. We have a sufficient background to understand this. What is stacking fault energy, which is expressed in the million joules per meter square. Okay. So the stacking fault energy plays an important role in the determining the deformation characteristics of polycrystalline material. This, this is a fundamental uh, property or characteristic of each material. Okay, so if you take uh, the stacking fault energy, by just looking at the values, you will be able to predict some kind of uh, dislocation activity, right? So the stainless steel typically, which is uh, having the stacking fault energy less than 10 millijoules per meter square has got a, a strain hardening coefficient of 0 0.45 okay and then the slip character is named as planar so we will try to see what it is okay then if you go to the next uh, metal copper which is uh, having a significantly higher stacking fault energy has got the strain hardening coefficient of 0 0.3 and the slip character is described as planar slash wavy. Finally, for aluminium, the stacking fault energy is very, very high, around 250 millijoules per meter square. For that, the strain hardening coefficient is 0 0.15 and the slip character is like this designated as uh, wavy. So now we have to just look at uh, uh, the individual you know deformation characteristics of each of these metals. So the, the table basically summarizes the material having two extreme cases of stacking fault energy. Of course the copper is uh, having some middle range. So how this uh, is going to determine the uh, deformation characteristic of these materials. So now we can relate uh, these things with the strain hardening coefficient. So what is the strain hardening coefficient uh, tells us from the previous uh, discussion, what do we understand? The more the strain hardening value, right, that means it will, the, the material will have a huge ability to strain harden. Strain hardening ability will be very, very high. I mean, that is the index of uh, uh, strain hardening coefficient, right? So, the material which is having a very small stacking fault energy, you can see that 
the strain hardening coefficient value is higher. So we have a very nice trend here. Lowest stacking fault energy, highest strain hardening coefficient. Highest strain stacking fault energy, lowest strain hardening coefficient. And these two are characterized as two extreme slip character. One is planar, other is wavy. We can relate all of them. Very interesting table and very important table as well. So, if the very uh, the material having very low stacking fault energy, it is going to strain harden significantly. But the slip characteristic is planar. That means the dislocations will try to move only in a planar fashion, not in the three-dimensional moment. It is not going to climb or cross slip so easily. They are all going to just pile up. The glide will be, is, they are going to glide only a single plane and that is going to be a primary uh, deformation mode. That is all we have to look at it. For a copper which is having the middle range of uh, stacking fault energy, which is, which will strain harden, but not to the extent of stainless steel, but at the same time it, is, it will be better than the aluminium. It, will going, it is going to strain harden. So, obviously, it is going to have or it is going to display both the slip characters, namely planar and wavy. So, this is something very important you have to uh, keep in mind. And if you look at the aluminium, which is having a very high stacking fault energy, and then you can relate all these stacking fault energy values with the dislocation dynamics and mechanics, which we are already familiar with, right? But when the stacking fault of energy is very high, in this context where we are talking about mechanical testing, especially a tensile test, the material is, uh, you know, having the low strain hardening coefficient is not going to strain harden much as compared to the um, stainless steel or copper. And the slip character is going to be wavy. So what is wavy slip? Wavy slip means it is going to the dislocation mobility will be in uh, three dimension. I mean, the three dimensional mobility is uh, facilitated by the high stacking fault energy. You can just uh, quickly move up and down. You can easily cross lip and uh, uh, climb and all that. But it may not be very you know, climb and all. It is primarily in a high temperature uh, mechanisms. But we, we are, here we are talking about cross lip, easy cross lip, and then it can move on to a different different uh, uh, slip planes which is available at a different um, height so that's all we are saying so the when the deformation takes place with such an ease so the the substructure which is going to uh, form is up they are all going to appear as a wavy in nature that's why it's called wavy slip nature okay so all the dislocation walls bundles uh, dislocation cells Sub such substructures, all of them will appear in a wavy form. That means it is not in an organized form. On the other hand, the the same dislocation uh, substructures will appear in a, a planar uh, fashion. So it will not be like a, a random uh, waviness will not be there. So it will be all uh, planar uh, segments. Okay. So that is that. Is, but just looking at the uh, dislocation substructures, you will be able to characterize. Uh, the deformation behavior. Uh, in, a, in a first look itself, you can just understand this and then of course, depending upon the interest, you can go to any, any level of analysis and investigation. So, the strain hardening coefficients which you obtain from a simple tensile test tells a quite a bit of a deformation characteristics if you connect that with the stacking fault energy. That's the message I want to bring here. The direct connection between the strain hardening and dislocation mobility makes it possible to relate strain hardening coefficients with stacking fault energy values as shown in the table. So when the stacking fault energy is low, the cross slip is restricted. So the barriers to dislocation movement remain effective to higher stress levels than in the material of higher stacking fault energy. That is to say, the low stacking fault energy material strain hardens to a greater extent. Note that the strain hardening coefficient increases with the decrease in stacking fault energy while the slip character changes from wavy to planar mode. Okay, so that is uh, one aspect of uh, 
the uh, tensile test the another important uh, aspect is instability gives tension so normally we look at uh, uh, in a tensile test the specimen is subjected to necking beyond certain uh, load right so that is called instability in tension so let us uh, learn a little more on this necking or localized deformation begins at maximum load where the increase in stress due to decrease in cross sectional area of the specimen becomes greater than the increase in the load carrying ability of the metal due to strain hardening okay so the moment the the cross section of the specimen becomes smaller and it becomes uh, a problem there because the load carrying ability of met material is affected that is what you have to see okay so that is what the strain hardening coefficient also will indicate this condition of instability leading to localized deformation is defined by the condition dp is equal to zero okay the change in load at the maximum that is dp is equal to zero so we can just uh, relate this uh, use this condition condition of instability uh, using this relation we will be able to derive few more equations p is equal to sigma a and dp is equal to sigma d a plus uh, a d sigma is equal to zero and um, from the volume constant c relationship we can write it like this dl by l is equal to minus dA by a which is which is equal to d epsilon and from this instability condition if you apply this instability condition here dp is equal to zero then minus dA by a is equal to d sigma by sigma so that at a point of tensile instability we reach an equation d sigma by d epsilon is equal to sigma this is very very useful and very important relation now we can look at all this in a graphical way so how to find the the point of necking at the maximum load there are two ways okay so the one is this is the sigma versus epsilon plot where you look at the point and then draw a subtangent of unity subtangent of unity draw from the maximum low draw a subtangent of unity that will indicate the uh, the maximum load of necking the point at which it's going to neck or the other way to find out is find out the intersection where the d sigma by d epsilon is equal to sigma so that is what we have found here okay so either this or this both of them will find out the um, the point of making at maximum low okay so that is, this is very important right and you can also check uh, in your uh, simple tensile test you can plot these two things uh, work hardening rate versus strain and uh, and stress versus strain plot you will be able to see that the the maximum uts will be the the lowest value of d sigma by epsilon will be matching this so so you will see that so another in, uh, interesting way of analysis analyzing this making uh, making phenomenon is let us uh, go through that the necking criterion can be expressed more explicitly if engineering strain is used d sigma by d epsilon can be written like this where d sigma by d e uh, into d by d epsilon so engineering a strain we know that we can express in terms of dl by l not and uh, again the true strain is dl by l so we can <coughs> manipulate this sorry d sigma is dl by l naught and d e is dl by l 
and this can be written like that l by l naught and this becomes l by l naught becomes 1 by 1 plus e d sigma by d e times 1 plus e which is nothing but sigma okay so we can rewrite this d sigma by d e is equal to sigma by 1 by e so what is the uh, usefulness of this you can this equation permits an interesting geometrical construction called considery construction for the determination of the point of maximum load here again we are going to do the same uh, exercise like what we have seen in the previous slide here it is called considery construction or considery condition we can say that so what you have to see here is uh, this is a sigma uh, versus epsilon plot so you try to uh, you first uh, take a, a negative point negative axis point a up to the uh, unity minus 1 and from there you try to draw a tangent to this curve and that point c okay that will give you the the point of necking at maximum load that is what this equation says so if you simply look at this uh, uh, slope that is a d sigma by d e which is nothing but sigma here plus 1 plus e that's what's shown here so the slope is sigma divided by 1 plus e so this is what is shown here so this stress strain uh, curve is plotted in terms of the true stress against conventional linear strain this is a kind of relation between the you know, true stress versus uh, uh, conventional strain okay. that is also the way of looking at this so this is what the description is uh, given here let point a represent a negative strain of one a linear a line sorry a line drawn from the point a which is tangent to the stress strain curve will establish a point of maximum load according to this equation okay so another important uh, relation we can get it we can obtain a simple relationship for a strain at which necking occurs this strain is true uniform strain if you recall i just mentioned uh, in the previous lecture that uh, we just looked at uh, uh, discussing the strain hardening exponents then expression uh, something close to this d sigma by d e is equal to n times sigma by epsilon so that that expression we have seen so if you recall that expression and then compare these two expressions this equation and that expression then you can relate this sigma sorry epsilon u is equal to n that means the uniform strain up to the maximum load which is equal to n this is also very important uh, relation so what is that uh, uh, useful usefulness of the strain hardening coefficient strain hardening coefficient can also be looked at the it is equal to uniform strain so the uniform strain is very important in the case of uh, materials uh, which is being subjected to metal forming operations right so the measure of ductility and formability and all. some idea it gives so these relations are uh, very important and useful in the in that context okay so one final uh, uh, description about this uh, instability in tension um, which is also uh, related to the uh, the different relationship we are looking at it the true fracture strength is the true stress at fracture. So beyond uh, the yielding point, sorry, not yielding point, beyond, beyond the maximum load, we just mentioned uh, in the previous lectures mm -hmm. that all these relationships are not going to be effective. So after the maximum load, what all we can uh, derive and combining these two strains, that is the intention of this slide. Okay. So we are talking about the true fracture strength that means 
the true stress at fracture. So, sigma f is equal to Pf by Af, where the final cross section area following fracture Af is determined from the measurement of averaged minimum diameter of pain, halves of the specimen put together. Similarly, the fracture ductility is a true strain at the final fracture. So, this also can be uh, measured and then we will see what, what we can do with this uh, expression. So, the reduction in area can be written like this 1 minus e to the power minus epsilon f and at fracture we can simply substitute this uh, uh, values. I mean this is a simple Coleman type of equation where we are now looking at only at the fracture. Okay. So, if you it is it is not sigma it is sigma f it is not k it is k1 and epsilon f to the power n or you can write a expression for k like this and then substitute this into the plastic strain epsilon p is k divided uh, sorry sigma divided by k1 to the power 1 by n and then this can be rewritten like this you, you simply substitute this value of k1 here, so then you will get uh, finally epsilon p is equal to epsilon f times sigma by sigma f to the power 1 by m. So, we can now write, uh, uh, bring the other relation, this is a engineering strain which is equal to sigma by e. The total strain we can bring in, so we now the, know that uh, epsilon p and epsilon e. So, total strain is equal to epsilon e plus epsilon p which is nothing but this expression sigma by e plus sigma by k1 to the power 1 by n which is nothing but sigma by e plus epsilon f times sigma divided by sigma f to the power 1 by n. So, this kind of just a uh, small um, manipulation gives as to visualize how to express the total strain um, okay, uh, in the tensile test results. So, some useful relations you can relate. One final uh, description about this instability in tension. Um, what, I, what you are seeing in this uh, schematic is, uh, this is a typical uh, dark bone tensile specimen which is subjected to the tensile force here. The strain is uh, less than epsilon e u. So, the capital E u is uh, the maximum load uh, engineering strain that is called uh, E is engineering and u is the ultimate. Okay, So, this notation is uh, uh, given in this reference. So, I have not changed that reference, but it is nothing but the strain at the uh, engineering strain at the maximum load. So, that is what you have to look at it. So, when this uh, strain is less than that uh, maximum load, nothing happens and then as the deformation proceeds, what happens? There is no necking here. So, what is the what is the physics we are trying to explain here? We will see. During tensile deformation, strain is periodically localized at weak links. So, when you say weak links here, it means uh, the diameter in the gauge length is much smaller as compared to the shoulder portion. So, that is what we are saying that. And for strains less than epsilon e u, that means uh, the maximum strain, that is the strain at the maximum load. If it is less than maximum load, the work hardening in these areas strengthen the material enough relative to the material outside of them so that the instability is removed. So, basically, when this is uh, this cross section is being pulled in tension, the immediately the necking does not form, the necking forms at much later stage. So, what happens during that time uh, before necking after deformation, plastic deformation commences. So, in between these two time, what is the physics that is what we are trying to see. So, that means what happens? So, the, the rest of the the whole area is getting strengthened. So, that is why the, it is almost like you know it is uh, equalizing the whole uh, specimen through the uniform strain or something like that. 
then the work hardening rate decreases with strain at the maximum load, the strain at maximum load. The fractional decrease in the cross sectional area at a weak link exactly compensates the increase in the flow strength due to the work hardening pair. So it is something like what we have just seen d sigma by d epsilon is equal to sigma. This is what it is. The moment that condition uh, reaches, that is actually this stage, the necking begins. Thus, the permanent instability is formed at the strain infinitesimally greater than epsilon mu, that is strain at the maximum. And this leads to neck formation. So, we are not telling anything new here, but then this uh, visual uh, uh, pictures of necking, what happens to the, the strain, okay, before the necking takes place, but then after the plastic deformation commences. So, in between, how the strain distribution occurs within the specimen. That aspect is being brought in this uh, schematic so nicely. So that's why I just wanted to share that. So uh, whatever we have just seen, uh, this table summarizes the whole result. Uh, it is. It will be very uh, handy if you just look at them in a, the one table. And we have the fundamental definition of engineering stress, true stress, engineering strain, true strain. And then these relationships just, ex I mean, they appear as it is prior to necking or with some equivalent relations. But after necking, how these relationships uh, is converted or it, is to be, it has to be looked at because all these relations are valid till the maximum load. Okay, prior to making. After making, we can use only these kind of relations. Okay, we cannot use the same relation. So that is uh, one advantage. We can just uh, refer this table and then try to understand which which are the relations are valid before making and after making. 